1985. It was the middle of the decade, and you could feel the 80s finding itself, growing up before our very eyes and becoming its own era. In fact, the 80s was when many of our own viewers grew up, and learning to grow up, it's a universal process. First, there's the lack of dignity. You develop a little attitude. You just watch your mouth, mister. And as you get older and wiser, you realize not to take crap from anyone. It's over enough! Enough! Today, we're going to talk about the news, culture, sports and entertainment, and all that was weird in the 80s. This is Timeline. Today, the future is going back to the year 1985. But before we get moving, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know a story from 85 you would like to see a full video on. Now, how alive was your 85? I feel tremendous. I'm ready to take all the world. Oh! This is 1985. 1985 started off on a seemingly positive note when National Geographic published a cover story of Coco the Gorilla, who learned sign language. Coco got a brand new kitten, which she named All Ball, because she thought her new pet looked like a ball. Compared to what my friends have named their pets, she is not the worst name giver. Sadly, All Ball was hit by a car after the kitten escaped Coco's cage the month before, in December of 84. When Coco was informed, she signed the words, bad, sad, bad. Frown, cry, frown, sad trouble. It wasn't all sad for Coco, though. A few months later, Francine Patterson, Coco's instructor and caregiver, allowed her to pick out two more kittens, which she did, calling them Lipstick and Smokey. In her time, Coco the Gorilla became quite the star, meeting celebrities like Robin Williams, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Mr. Rogers. On January 20th, Ronald Reagan began his second term as the President of the United States. If you think Reagan was busy during the first half of the 80s, wait till you see what he does during the next four years. What's that? Sushi. You won't accept a guy's tongue in your mouth and you're gonna eat that? Can I eat? I don't know. Give it a try. Moving into early February, the World Chess Championship match in Moscow between Anatoly Karpov and Garry Kasparov ended in controversy when the finals were postponed due to psychological strain. Fast forward to September 3rd when the championship matches were resumed and Kasparov stunned Karpov in the 13-11 defeat. Mickey Mouse made a surprise visit to China on February 19th in honor of Disneyland's 30th anniversary. China became the first stop on Mickey's 30-city goodwill tour. Fast forward 31 years later to June 16th, 2016, when Shanghai gets a Disneyland of its very own, Shanghai Disneyland Park. For scale, the cost of two adults and one child visiting the park on two-day weekend tickets would cost the average Chinese adult one month's wages. Speaking of children, we go to Bloomington, Indiana, where Hoosier basketball coach Bobby Knight took his childlike temper tantrums to the next level. On Saturday, February 23rd, just five minutes into the game against Purdue, Knight lost his on a loose ball foul call and proceeded to throw a chair onto the court. The refs rang Knight up with two technical fouls, which ejected him from the game. The Big Ten gave Knight a one-game suspension with two years probation. So how did she get stuck with a guy like this? It's you and me, kid. It's a romantic comedy. Really looking forward to working with you, kid. Moonlighting, premiering Sunday, March 3rd. It doesn't get any weirder than this. Huggies Diapers were awarded the infamous Pig Award on March 3rd, given to them by Women Against Pornography. The feminist group stated that Huggies television ads crossed the line between eye-catching and porn. The Women Against Pornography called out Huggies for its gratuitous creep shot of a mother picking up her newborn baby. Mom leans in and exposes her underwear to the world. Yeah, moving on. Three days later, on March 6th in Albany, New York, Michael Gerard Tyson made his boxing professional debut. He was only 18 years old when he stepped into the ring. Tyson's first opponent, it was Hector Mercedes. And with a vicious body shot, Tyson quickly wrecked Mercedes with a first round TKO. Tyson would go on to win 26 of his first 28 fights by KO or TKO, 16 of those coming in the first round. In fact, Tyson's quickest knockout was a year later on July 26, 1986, when Tyson met Joe Frazier's son, Marvis. Tyson KO'd Frazier in 30 seconds. Overcut, and Marvis is hurt! Frazier is down! 
We'll see more of Iron Mike in the coming years. Back to 85, on March 7th, We Are the World, the charity single for Ethiopian famine relief, written by Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, was released. It rode the number one spot for four weeks. The song was famously recorded at The Gambler, Kenny Rogers' lion's share recording studio in Hollywood. All of the decade's most iconic voices participated. Stevie Wonder, Bob Dylan, Tina Turner, Bruce Springsteen, and Dan Aykroyd? The only person who overshadowed this all-star recording session didn't even show up to the recording studio. Prince, who was at the peak of his popularity, spent the night hanging out at Carlos and Charlie's, the Sunset Strip nightclub at the time. Prince's night out would make headlines the next day when his bodyguard beat up a paparazzi as he tried to exit the club. Three days later, the Soviet Union's General Secretary, Konstantin Chernyenko, died after a long fight with emphysema and associated lung and heart damage on March 10th. He led the Soviets for just over a year, from February 13, 1984. Mikhail Gorbachev then took the helm as the Soviet's General Secretary. We'll see a bit more from Mr. Gorbachev later. Going from Russia across the Bering Sea to Alaska, Libby Riddles made history when she became the first woman to win the prestigious Iditarod Trail sled dog race on March 31st. At 29 years old, Riddles mushed her 14 Huskies through 938 miles of snowy cross-country terrain with a time of 18 days, 20 minutes, and 17 seconds. On the very same day, we go to a sold-out Madison Square Garden, where the very first WrestleMania was seen by one million rabid fans. The event consisted of nine matches, including the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov versus the U.S. Express with Captain Lou Albano, Andre the Giant versus Big John Studd, and somehow Cindy Lauper became a manager. The main event was a battle for the ages, featuring Hulk Hogan and Mr. T, who doubled up to defeat Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff and Rowdy Roddy Piper. Madison, he got up, he got up. And of course, who could forget the honorary guest timekeeper that night, Liberace. From New York to China on April 7th, when George Michael and Andrew Ridgely, the duo better known as Wham, performed in China, being the first band from the West to ever do so. The gig was actually supposed to go to Queen. Freddie Mercury wanted to be the first ever to play China. When Wham's manager heard this, he sent a video of Mercury's flamboyant performances to Chinese authorities. When the event organizers saw Mercury, they opted for Wham, who was presented far more conservatively. Arriving in mid-April, we would see boxer Marvelous Marvin Hagler go toe-to-toe with Tommy the Hitman Hearns at Caesars Palace. Hagler won in the third round by knockout, and despite only going such a short distance, is still considered to be one of the best fights ever. On April 23rd, New Coke was introduced to the public, and the public was not okay with a newer, sweeter flavor. After an initial 7% boost in sales the first few days on the market, consumers revolted, and Pepsi gained 14% of Coca-Cola's market share. Fast forward to July, when Coca-Cola executives announced a return to their original formula. Despite the negative press, New Coke stuck around until 2002. On the same day as New Coke, we go back to the USSR, when Mikhail Gorbachev sought to decentralize economic decisions to improve efficiency by making economic reforms known as perestroika. The literal meaning of perestroika is restructuring, referring to the restructuring of the Soviet political and economic system. Fast forward to October 1990, when Gorbachev was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, in part for his pivotal role in ending the Cold War. We go to mid-May, and with an average of 28.2 points per game and magically turning the crappy Bulls into playoff contenders, Michael Jordan was awarded the NBA's Rookie of the Year. Also in 1985, Nike introduced Air Jordans. The shoes were $65 a pair, well over the cost of an average high top at the time. And at first, banned by the NBA. Air Jordans created a shoe-crazed nation and were the coolest high-top and three-fourth cut shoes of the decade, and maybe still are. Today, the Jordan brand is worth over $3 billion. On May 20th, the FBI arrested John Anthony Walker, a United States Navy chief warrant officer and communications specialist who had been spying for the Soviet Union since 1968 for $1,000 a week. Walker's ex-wife turned him into the FBI after years of pleading with him to stop. Fast forward to August when Walker was tried and sentenced to life in prison. 
Walker died in 2014, one year before he was eligible for parole. No law, no war can stop him. Sylvester Stallone is back. As Rambo, First Blood, Part 2. A notable culinary first, bagel bites were invented by tennis partners Bob Mosher and Stanley Garzinski, both from Fort Myers, Florida. The two invested $20,000 into the company and sold $1 million worth of their bites in the first year. On June 1st, when Harold Faltermeyer's Axel F, Beverly Hills Cop's theme song hit number three on the Billboard charts. Faltermeyer later said the film's producers originally disliked the direction he was taking the score and wanted to throw the music out. It wasn't until Martin Brest voiced his approval that the studio exec showed enthusiasm about the music. Later in June, Larry McMurdy's Western novel Lonesome Dove was released on the 13th. The story of the relationships between retired Texas Rangers and their old West adventures was so well received, it inspired a coveted miniseries. Fast forward to February 5, 1989, when heavy hitters like Robert Duvall, Angelica Houston, and Tommy Lee Jones starred in a television adaptation. But really, who could forget water moccasins? Ah, water moccasins! On June 15th, Danai was attacked, Rembrandt's life-size depiction of the character Danai from Greek mythology, the mother of Perseus. Bronius Magus, a Soviet-Lithuanian national later judged insane, threw sulfuric acid on the canvas and cut it twice with a knife. Magus claimed that destroying the painting was his way to champion Lithuania's independence from the USSR. Later, he said he was generally against nude art. So yeah, thanks, Bronius. In late June, we go to the road, where you could no longer get your kicks, because Route 66, the highway which spanned 2,200 miles from Chicago, Illinois to Santa Monica, California, was officially removed from the United States highway system after it had been replaced in its entirety by segments of the interstate highway system. At the end of June, James Dewar, baker and inventor of the Twinkie, died after a lifetime of working for Hostess Brands Bakery. He started as one of the company's delivery boys in 1920 in a horse-drawn cart, retiring in 1972 as the company's vice president. Dewar became a hero on April 6, 1930 in the snack cake industry when he filled a tube of shortcake with banana cream and called it the Twinkie. During World War II, bananas were rationed and the company was forced to switch to vanilla cream, the flavor we enjoy today. In Houston, Nolan Ryan became the first pitcher to strike out 4,000 batters on July 11th, when the 38-year-old hurler fanned New York Mets outfielder Danny Heath during the bottom of the sixth. Breaking ball and that's it. Strikeout number 4,000 for Nolan Ryan. Considered one of the greatest pitchers ever, Ryan is known for three things. He has the current MLB record for most career strikeouts with 5,714. Ryan could hit 100 miles per hour on the radar gun until he retired at 46. And this pummeling of Robin Ventura on August 4th, 1993. Watch out. Look at this. Back to 85. And on July 13th, the music industry from England and America hosted simultaneous music festivals at Wembley Stadium in London and John F. Kennedy Stadium in Philadelphia. It was a joint effort to raise funds for relief of the ongoing Ethiopian famine. While musicians like David Bowie, U2, Paul McCartney, and Queen headlined Wembley, the Philly crowd saw a shaky Led Zeppelin reunion, peak Madonna, Mick Jagger with Tina Turner, and Tom Petty. Of course, you also had the show-off. After his set at Wembley Stadium, Phil Collins caught the Concord and landed in Philadelphia in time to do a second set at JFK. The next month on August 26th, 13-year-old Ryan White began attending classes at Western Military School in Kokomo, Indiana via a telephone hookup at his home. Ryan became a national poster child for AIDS in the U.S. after his school administrators barred him from attending classes in person once he acquired the disease from a contaminated blood transfusion. Fast forward a year later to August 31st, 1986, when Ryan enrolled at Hamilton Heights High School in Arcadia, Indiana, after the kids and parents of Western Middle School ran him out of town. 
Southern Californians were able to sleep a little better on August 31st. That was the day Richard Ramirez was caught, beaten, and handed over to the LAPD by a group of neighborhood locals who spotted the serial killer wandering the streets of East LA. Flash forward to September 20th, 1989, when the Night Stalker was convicted of all charges. 13 counts of murder, five attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. Moments after being sentenced to death by gas chamber, Ramirez said, big deal, death always went with the territory. See you in Disneyland. Moving into the 1st of September, after decades of disappointing searches and salvage expeditions, the RMS Titanic was finally found off the coast of Newfoundland. While the ship's wreckage is too unstable and delicate to salvage, divers recovered thousands of items which have been conserved and put on public display. Of course, the Titanic's popularity didn't peak until we... Fast forward to November 1997, when James Cameron's Titanic set sail. It's been 84 years. Made of plastic, microchips here and there. She's a small wonder. Now, you're always a bit ornery, unpleasant, impolite, even downright mean. That's part of your charm. Thank you, you bed hopping relic. <laughs> To Silicon Valley, where Steve Jobs resigned from Apple on September 16th after losing a battle for control of the company with then-CEO John Scully. The corker is that Jobs poached Scully from Pepsi because of his marketing genius. The pair ran Apple as co-CEOs, but when Jobs wanted more say in which direction the company would go, Apple's board told Jobs he was too volatile to hold a leadership role. On the same day, Jobs submitted paperwork to the California Secretary of State for the name of his new company, Next Computer. Fast forward to 1997, when Apple would buy Next for $429 million and give Jobs an advisory role back at Apple HQ. Now, when music and politics collide. September 21st, Dee Snyder, lead singer of Twisted Sister, testified before the U.S. Senate in defense of music censorship. The Washington Wives, a small group of high-ranking government officials' wives, wanted to give albums ratings, the same way the MPAA rated movies. Hoping he'd embarrass himself, everyone was shocked when Snyder, dressed like an 80s rock star Halloween costume, eloquently made a case for uncensored music. As the creator of Under the Blade, I can say categorically that the only sadomasochism, bondage, and rape in this song is in the mind of Ms. Gore. The Oregon Trail was first released for the Apple II. It was no Burger Time or Mario Brothers, but as far as personal computer games went, it was okay. Plus, kids learned about the realities of 19th century pioneer life on the Oregon Trail and the many ways to die. Dysentery again? Pac-Man never taught us anything like that. Spurred by a controversial, off-the-cuff remark from Bob Dylan in July during his set for Live Aid in Philadelphia, Willie Nelson, John Mellencamp, and Neil Young took it upon themselves to organize Farm Aid. A wide variety of musicians like Johnny Cash, Tom Petty, Loretta Lynn, Sammy Hagar with Eddie Van Halen, and 50 other A-listers arrived in Champaign, Illinois on September 22nd to help raise over $9 million for America's independent farmers and their families. From the heartland USA to the Soviet bloc, the USSR suffered from a national economic crash during September when Saudi Arabia started rapidly increasing its petroleum extraction. Saudi Arabia's increase in oil production led to a collapse in the price of a barrel of oil, which fell as low as $7. Fast forward to December 26, 1991, when the Supreme Soviet voted the USSR itself out of existence. Five years after the Saudis' change in oil exporting paved the road for the Soviet Union's collapse. All right, hot shot. So you got a golden palomino between your knees and no rings. Now what? To video games. It was on October 18th, Nintendo Entertainment Systems made its North American debut to a small test market in New York City. The first NES gaming system cost your parents $149.99, and it came complete with Super Mario Bros., Duck Hunt, a light gun attachment for Duck Hunt, and an extra controller. And let's not forget, you needed extra lung capacity for blowing on a cartridge just to get a game to work. By 1990, 30% of all American households owned a Nintendo, compared to 23% for homes that had a personal computer. 
Three days later, on October 21st, former San Francisco supervisor Dan White was found in his home's garage, dead behind the wheel of his wife's car, less than six years after he assassinated San Francisco Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. Oh. You may also remember White as the man who defended the murders with what's now mockingly known as the Twinkie Defense. White's legal team claimed that White killed Moscone and Milk because the former health nut had become addicted to junk food. The jury didn't buy White's Twinkie excuse, and White served five years on a soft seven-year sentence. New York Yankees management fired Billy Martin on October 27th, officially ending the Billy IV era of Yankees baseball. It was the fourth time Martin had been fired as the Yankees manager. He never admitted it, but the call most likely came from Steinbrenner, who dealt with Martin's fights on and off the field and unpaid debts. Fast forward to 1988, when the Yankees would sign Martin as the season's manager for the fifth time. The 60-year-old manager was fired before the season ended, but while he was in the pinstripes during the 88 season, he never lost his fury. Crack made its first appearance in the New York Times on November 17th, when the paper described it as a super drug. This wasn't your daddy's cocaine. It was addictive, cheap, and lethal. In the 80s, the drug would devastate black communities, and with tough on crime policies as well as the war on drugs, harsh mandatory drug sentencing would be the catalyst for the prison population boom. The nation's response to crack? Fast forward to 1992, when Pee Wee Herman filmed this David Lynchian PSA about the dangers of crack. Look, everybody wants to be cool, but doing it with crack isn't just wrong. It could be dead wrong. We're not going to show it. But November 18th marks the day the New York Giants' Lawrence Taylor broke Joe Theismann's leg in three during a Monday night football game. It was the live, uncensored graphic rawness that would stick in any viewer's traumatized memory decades after it happened. That day would be Theismann's last day as a football player. Theismann would move on to announcing NFL games, but his big broadcasting moment came when he hosted American Gladiators. Fast forward and to the date of Theismann's injury on November 18th, 2018, when J.J. Watt and Kareem Jackson inflicted the same injury to another Washington quarterback, Alex Smith. Worth noting, as of the making of this video, Alex Smith is returning to the NFL. Yeah. Now he's worried. You cut it. You're hurting. You see? You see? He's not a machine. He's a man. You have to Moving into December, the Chicago Bears released the Super Bowl Shuffle on the third. Fast forward to February 1st, 1986, when the Super Bowl Shuffle peaked at number 41 on the Billboard Hot 100. For a decade filled with great music, how did that happen? Two days later, on December 5th, Christopher Forbes, vice president of Forbes magazine, bought a 1787 Chateau Lafitte Claret for $157,000. The rare 198-year-old bottle of wine was said to have once been owned by Thomas Jefferson. Glug, 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 glug. Mmm, fancy. Fast forward to 2005, when billionaire wine collector Bill Koch, yes, that Koch of the shadowy Koch brothers, bought four bottles of 1787 Chateau Lafitte from the same batch Forbes bought his bottle. Koch's staff began the process of certifying the four bottles and soon found out the entire batch, including Forbes' bottle, were fakes. Glug, 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 glug. Mmm, fakes. On December 23rd in Reno, Nevada, 20-year-old James Vance and 18-year-old Ray Belknap shot themselves in an apparent suicide pact. Vance's parents lawyered up and sued Judas Priest, alleging the boys were told to shoot themselves in a subliminal message in an eight-year-old Priest song, Better By You, Better Than Me. July 1990, when Vance and Belknap's lawyers finally got Priest in court. The parents were asking for $6.2 million in damages. Lead singer Rob Helfer said, if he was ever going to put a subliminal message in his songs, it would be to buy more albums. The judge ultimately decided that the group was not responsible. Turning to true crime, Diane Fossey, one of the foremost primatologists in the world, best known for her study of the mountain gorillas, was found murdered on December 27th in the bedroom of her cabin in Rwanda. Three years later, Fossey's story would hit the screen. 
Universal Pictures and Warner Brothers present Sigourney Weaver, Brian Brown, in the true story of one woman's incredible courage. Finally, on the last day of the year, which would end on a somber note, on his way to headline a big New Year's Eve gig in Texas, Rick Nelson died when his plane crashed in a pasture less than two miles from a landing strip. Nelson, his girlfriend, and his band died. The two pilots escaped the burning wreckage from the cockpit windows. After a year-long investigation, the National Transportation Safety Board concluded that a definite cause of the crash was unknown. Nelson was 45. 1986 was just around the corner when America would get the need, the need for speed. A human chain would form across the country and a future media giant show would make its debut. But you're just gonna have to wait until next year. Coming up next, 1986. So what do you think? What year from the 80s was your favorite year? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these only about the 1980s videos from our weird history.